This episode of On the Limb with Nature's Voice Game Calls is brought to you by Bolts Lawn Care LTD Company. Bolts Lawn Care is a professional lawn care and landscaping business that's been in the business for over 20 years. Bolts Lawn Care specializes in lawn care, landscape, drain work, and so much more. Call Bolts Lawn Care LTD today for any and all of your outdoor needs. Bolts Lawn Care offers free estimates. Give them a call today, 304-543-6565. That's Bolts Lawn Care, 304-543-6565. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of On the Limb Podcast with Nature's Voice Game Calls. Boy, I tell you what, uh, we've had some amazing home cooking the past couple days. Yesterday and this evening, man, we had deer tenderloins yesterday with homemade gravy. This evening, we had venison shoulder roast, and we slow cooked it since like 10.30 last night. I mean, we put that thing in late, but we slow cooked it all the way through the night into the day today. And I tell you what, I'm just about as full as a tick. <laughs> I mean, I have uh, dipped about everything I can in that gravy and ate it th- this evening. I was like, good Lord. So, you know, we've been using that Hunt Chef, you know, rub that they've got. It's called Tin Ring. And, uh, man, it is some good stuff. So I've got uh, Dan Hall here with me, co-host, on the phone. How you doing, Dan? Hi, man. I'm doing good. It's uh, been a long week or two there. I missed out a couple, couple in-studio sessions, but we yeah, me on the phone again. You've been out for a while. You're you're coming back from Ohio this evening, aren't you? Yeah, I flew in from Arizona today, so driving back from Ohio. Yeah, so I was just talking about the dinners that we've had there a couple the last couple of days, deer tenderloins and... We had some. Oh, yeah. uh, well, deep... I'm not going to tell you what all I had. I had some elk, <laughs> fresh elk, and yeah. some antelope, and you know, some of them western region critters. Yeah, you had all that good stuff, man. I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love venison, but when it comes to elk, I like it better than beef. Oh yeah. But you know, That's we. Really I was mentioning the hunt chef seasoning we use. I, I kind of mixed it up a little bit this time. I did some tin ring, and I combined it with feather duster and rubbed it on that uh, shoulder and, and put it in a crock pot. Oh, my gosh. I mean, the the taste oh, of yeah. that thing was amazing. Oh, I bet that tin ring's something now. Yeah, it is. And it's kind of got like a, I don't know, I kind of called it tonight. It's kind of like it's got a, I think it's got a little bit of cumin in it. It may. Cause I kind of, yeah, I kind of caught a hint of that taste, but well, uh, we've got a special guest on this evening, Tyler Melton, which is the houndsman for Highland Outfitters based out of, uh, Wyoming there. We just, uh, become partners with them. They're one of our newest ad partners and, uh, they're an outfitting company out there in uh, Wyoming. Tyler's from, uh, Sheridan, Wyoming, and now he resides in, uh, Gillette, Wyoming. So, um. Our main focus this evening is going to be talking about big cats and big cat hunting. We've got a, a live poll going on right now. It should be going on for about five minutes. So you got about another minute left on that. So those uh, elusive mountain lions from the West, let's talk about those. So without further ado, please welcome with me, Tyler Melton. Tyler, how you doing, sir? Good. How are you guys doing? Sounds, it sounds like... Sounds like I should have been at your guys' house to eat tonight. I, I ate about like a coyote. Oh, well, we eat them here, too. <laughs> yeah, as, as a matter of fact, we do. I cooked one of those a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, well, I shouldn't say uh, we. So, well, now, you know, speaking on odd game, I'm going to hit on this real quick. This wasn't something we, met, we, we planned on talking. What do you think about eating mountain lion? Well, I'll tell you this. It's it's got its own unique taste. The the closest I can explain to anybody, it's more of like a pork and a chicken texture. 
And uh, if you've eaten enough Chinese buffet, you've probably eaten cat a time or two in your life. So, <laughs> absolutely. Well, if that's the case, then I love cat. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this: it's it's a the the full paw behind it is it's a white meat. Okay. So yeah. it cooks up white. I mean, it's uh, it's not quite like bear or elk or anything. It's uh, it's its own it's its own brand. Wow, you know, See, you know, I, and I've heard people that ate it said it's actually pretty daggone tasty. Hmm. It is. It's really lean, so it's best you know breaded and fried or brined yeah, uh, sure. or crock potted. Yeah, uh, you know, putting a steak on there or doing burger with it, it's pretty pretty lean. Yeah, you know, hmm. that's how I'd fix it: crock potted or put it on a smoker or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's phenomenal meat, and uh, I think it gets a it gets a bad rap because it's it's a cat. But I mean, crap! I think Stephen Ranella has a bunch of recipes on how to prepare mountain lion. Oh, really? Nice. In uh, one of his cookbooks, because uh, he did a mountain lion hunt there, and he he did one in Arizona or New Mexico, and then. He was able to be successful in his home state of Montana. Awesome. Well, let's uh, yeah. let's start it off with uh, telling us a little bit about yourself and um, how you got into becoming a houndsman. Okay. Yeah, I grew up about like everybody hunting and fishing, you know, was kind of a way of life. I mean, when I was going to school out here in Wyoming, opening day of deer season and elk season we always got a holiday from school because the attendance was so low and so my stepdad that i grew up a lot with he uh raised pheasant hunting dogs retrievers you know duck upland game birds we weren't in a really good flyway so it was he was mostly doing pheasants and quail and chucker and grouse um So that's kind of what I grew up with dogs my whole life. And then about the time I got out of school, I uh, met a trapper. And lions were always something that was on my bucket list that always fascinated me that, you know, all the years I spent hunting, I never seen one. Never, ever seen one. Seen tracks, seen kills, but never, ever got to see one in my life. Oh, wow. And... I pulled this guy out of a ditch that had a dog box and got to talking with him. And this was in uh, 2000, winter 2003, 2004. And he took me on my first lion hunt and I was hooked. From watching the dogs run the track to seeing the lion and he took me under his wing and he's uh The guy who taught me has passed on, and he was old school. It was when we turned the dogs loose, we matched them track for track. We, uh, there was, he never used telemetry collars or nothing. Hmm. And it was, it was very similar to how you did it in the old school days. And if those dogs trashed, you wound up on a really long day. Yeah. So, so So, what keeps you so intrigued when hunting them? Is it, is it, uh, do you have to be a dog lover or is it just like any other hunting to get you excited? Well, you know, I guide big game. I do, uh, animal elk, mule deer. Um, I've been on sheep hunts. I've done mountain goat hunts. I've hunted almost every state in the West and Mount lion hunting is hands down my most favorite and i think it's just for the love of the dogs and seeing how how they work and being able to see it all come together is what does it for me i mean it's a different style of hunting i mean it's it's more camaraderie than it is actual stalking and calling and this and that i mean it's it's its own hunt Okay. It's not like anything you would ever do. So kind of kind of like duck hunting maybe without the calls. Well, kind of. I mean, you're covering a lot of country 
in the mountains of the most rugged terrain looking for one track where a lion possibly ca- crossed a road yeah or where you can see some birds come up and hike into what you believe is a lion kill yeah i hope to uh, experience this one day but just just thinking about it and you hearing you talk about it i would think you know like you're saying camaraderie and stuff maybe it's like the same thing as being in a duck blind and then, but you're 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 covering a lot of ground like you're saying yeah i mean that's yeah i i mean for that's about what it's like i mean it's there's five ten minutes of actual being quiet and getting up to the tree and seeing the animal versus 90 percent of it's driving around looking for this track yeah and looking yeah. for a mature lion yeah, so that, that would fall into the category because we don't really, we don't have them out here. Well, we have them, but they say we don't, you know, whatever. But that's like us on bear hunting with hound, with the hounds. Yeah. You know, yep. It's how it works is about the same concept. You know, they, you're, you're driving around until you get something and you lose the dogs and then the game's on. Yep. I mean, it, there's a lot of camaraderie till it's game time. When the dogs strike, or you find that track, that's when it starts. You know, I mean, and you're looking for one bear, one lion in a ton of country. I mean, it's it's the definition of a needle in a haystack. Yeah. So. So, uh, talking about hunting, then, what's, what's your seasons and your regulations like out there? Or anywhere so, that you do, do hunt them, rather. So... We'll take Wyoming and then branch out from there. So Wyoming is a really great state with really good ma- uh, mountain lion management. We have, it opens September 1st to March 30th to the end of March, March 31st in all areas on a quota system. And so each okay. area has its own unique quota and once it's closed this year we did get our pursuit season passed so wyoming resident houndsmen will be able to still pursue and train dogs on mountain lions in closed areas but not for harvest and so there's a few areas in the state of wyoming that they have deemed It's heavy livestock areas is what it is. And they deem those predators more of a nuisance and they're open year round with unlimited quota. So you can hunt, pursue mountain lions all year round. Like the area to the north of Tom's Lodge of Highland Outfitting is unlimited quota open all year long. Nice. But it's some rough, nasty, forgiving, unforgiving country. <laughs> oh, I can guarantee okay. it, man. You know, and, you know, then you go to Montana, which has a draw system, opens December 1st. And then most areas, that's when your draw time is. And then it goes to general quota, uh, I think, ended. January, mid January, it goes to uh, a quota on those specific areas in those hunt districts in Montana. Idaho is season and quota based. Utah is draw area and quota based. Arizona, I just actually got back from Sholo, Arizona two weeks ago. I was down there hunting. And it is depending, it's got area quotas and then it's got like the whites and the white mountains and some of that other tribal land is unlimited quota open all year round. And in Southern Arizona, um, those units are open all year round as well. It's a good thing you got out of there about two weeks ago because I know last week was nasty. Yeah, yeah, I sold you know, that. Uh, 
two dogs to a guy in Flagstaff, and he said they got about three foot of snow. Good boy. Said, yeah. Good. Last year we had feet of snow. I mean, that we had to. I track. I put tracks on my Ranger December fifteenth, and I never took them off till April. I mean, it was bad when you dump the dogs out of the box and they'd go to the bottom of the hole and you couldn't even, you'd have to pick them up by the collar. <laughs> no doubt, yeah. I mean, it made it pretty easy trailing because, I mean, when you cut a cat track, you could see where it was cutting a trough through. So, I mean, Ray Charles pr- could probably trail them cats out. Sure. <laughs> there, there wasn't a whole lot of dipping and diving and rock jumping or anything last year it was yeah. pretty pretty easy short races so obviously you're you're hunting these cats you know when snow is on the ground and uh is it uh is it mostly in the mountainous areas that you're hunting them or like you're saying in arizona is it in some of the flatter areas too it it's it's predator prey base so yeah i hunt where Depending on the time of year, I hunt where the game is. You know, when it's hot here in the summer and in the spring when it's starting to heat up and the snow is melted off and the deer and elk are following the green grass up the mountain and stuff, I focus my areas based on prey. Um, If there's no deer in an area, they're probably isn't going to be any lions either i got you i mean oh, so yeah, that makes sense. yeah yeah and so i i mean guiding we hunt snow me as a person i don't mind i prefer hunting the springtime when i can hunt in a t-shirt and i like hunting off horseback or mule um and really having the dogs grind out a track okay. you know it's it's more rewarding than finding a track, dumping a set of dogs. And, you know, that's what everybody sees, but it's, it's law of averages. As far as if you want a true dry ground lion hunt, you may start a track once every seven to 10 days, unless you know, there's a cat in the area. That's where I believe it's Arizona is getting away from the cell phone camera um trail cameras because that's a houndsman started utilizing that technology and were able to get a higher success rate on their mountain lion hunts because i mean guys don't want to pay this five six seven ten thousand dollars to come out and hunt marginal conditions i mean they want to come hunt when yeah you you want want almost a guarantee you're going to spend yeah. that kind of money. You don't want to go back to tax suit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's, it's exhausting. And part of my job that they don't see is I'm hunting. I work out in the oil field. So I work a week on a week off. So I only work half the year. Yeah. And so with the vacation time, I hunt, you know, on average about a hundred to 122 days a season. Wow. Man, And so with that, I'm archiving where I see lion sign, where I've seen big toms cross, where I've seen females, where I'm like, okay, you know, I got two females in this drainage in between these couple of drainages, and I've already killed that tom out of there. So here in a month or two, I need to really focus my efforts on this because there should be another tom coming into this range. Gotcha. especially coming up here next month is the start of when lions start breeding into March and stuff. And those big toms will really, really go outside of their range to look for females. Okay. Gotcha. And then when they find a female that's in heat, they'll, they'll stay with them for 10 days or a week. And I mean, they breed them up to 50 times a day. Like it's pretty yeah. incredible what these lions do. That's nuts. Must be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, and with them having, you know, a litter 
once every year and a half, right. then it then it flips to just like bears. If that female has a tom cub or something, and that tom lion can smell him or s- smells him or something in his area, he'll kill that that mom's kitten, and then wow. she'll c- cycle back into heat again because they're those toms are very territorial. They'll you know when you get in their area, you'll find their scrape line, and usually wherever you find them crossing. Within about two weeks, they'll cross within, you know, a couple hundred yards, quarter mile of where you cut their track prior. Hmm. Man, that's they'll come back through. Well, we're going to take a real quick break here, and then once we come back, we'll talk about uh, regulations, uh, seasons, and some education. So have a word from our sponsors, and we'll be right back. This episode of On the Limb with Nature's Voice Game Calls is brought to you by Long Spur Tracking and Outfitting. Longspur has 28 trackers covering nine states. West Virginia, Virginia, Ohio, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Illinois, and Iowa. Check them out for all your tracking needs on their Facebook page or visit them at www.whitetaildeertracking.com or contact them today at 304-439-1659. Longspur Tracking and Outfitting, www.whitetaildeertracking.com or 304-439-1659. Contact them today. All right, guys. Thank you. Hey, before we get into get back into it, let me, let me jump on this and get our salute to Valor this evening. Uh, so tonight, our salute to Valor is going to go out to Brian Luce. I hope I said that right. I'm not sure. L-U-C-E. He's uh, from Sydney, New York. He was in the United States Air Force as a major. He served for 15 and a half years before he took an early retirement. He was stationed from Air Force, uh, Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland, uh, Columbus Air Force Base, Minnow Air Force Base, Fort Rutgers, uh, Marine Corps Air Station in New River, North Carolina, Kirtland Air Force Base, Holbrook Field, and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. He did two tours of duty to uh, Afghanistan, one to Iraq, uh, yeah, I'm not, one to Africa and one somewhere else, and I don't even know how to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was looking at that too. <laughs> oh, I, I know how to say it, I just can't think of it right now. Uh, Djibouti. He was awarded a Matoria Service Medal, Air Medal, Joint Combination Medal, Aerial Achievement Medal uh, with Oak Leaf Cluster, a NATO Medal, Afghanistan Campaign, uh, Air Force Achievement with Oak Leaf Cluster, Expert Marksmanship with a Bronze Star, and uh, he got out in December of 2015. So we just want to thank you, Brian, for your service. Uh, That was a pretty presumptuous career you had there yeah. before retiring early, which is nothing wrong with that. Yep. Hope everything was good with that, and you're enjoying the rest of your time now. We thank you. Yep, thank you, Brian, for your service, and God bless you, sir. Yep, thank you for your service, too. All right, so let's get back into some big cats. Uh, talking about the seasons, what kind of seasons do you all have out there? Um, We just got it, it's kind of an odd thing because it, it, our seasons actually cross a calendar year. So for residents, it kind of, it, it sucks because we have to buy two tags a winter, basically, because okay. our tags are only valid for a calendar year. And as a houndsman or to run in the state of Wyoming, you have to in the chase actively in the chase there has to be one valid license Mm -hmm. and in a valid hunt area um states like montana and stuff houndsmen only have to have a houndsman permit in idaho if i want to run dogs over that my own dogs over there i have to draw a permit a hound handler's permit okay and then that is good for their spring bear and their fall lion, but it's only good for a calendar year as well. So even though their seasons just like ours 
carry over a calendar year, you would be eligible for the fall season and the spring season is kind of how they refer them. Okay, nice. And then in other states, it's it's a draw tag. And, you know, South Dakota is a, is a draw permit for the state park to run with dogs. And then right. residents can buy what they call a boot hunting tag where you get a mountain lion tag, but you can only use game calls or spot and stock. You cannot use dogs in any manner. Okay. So what's yeah. your limits then? I, I think you hit on that a little bit. I just can't remember. Like, well, so in a winter, a person could harvest two mount. You could actually harvest up to four mountain lions. You can get a reduced price mountain lion tag that are unlimited quota. So in a winter, you could buy two in 2023 and you could buy another two in 2024, but you wouldn't be eligible for a license until 2025. Okay. Okay. So the most maximum you can possess in a calendar year is two. Okay. That makes sense. But, you know, there's some areas that don't close. So a guy could go to area one, kill one in 2023 and go back to that same area. If they haven't met their quota and kill another one out of that same area in 2024. Okay. Nice. But on average, I think we harvest around 300 and between 240 and 300 mountain lions on average a season statewide. Wow, nice. Man, and that's... in the north northeast corner where I live in those areas, um, area 1, 30, and 32, they has a quota of 75 mountain lions. Man. I mean, you just think Between about that, though. You think about those areas. numbers when it's when you come when you're talking about like deer, or elk, or any other animal. I mean, that's not a lot. No, it isn't. I mean, and it's because you know, is it is it because of the regulations or is it because they're so hard to hunt? Uh, they're really hard to hunt, and there's not as many around as a guy would think. I mean, yeah, they are so rangy, like. An average tom has a 22 square mile home range. Wow! Where, you know, hey, you're that's, thinking that's of, a lot. Yeah, you're thinking of your deer at home that get or get born, live their entire life on a hundred acres. Yeah. And these cats, I mean, are rangy. I mean, they huh. they follow their game. And that's just their home area. I mean, that isn't counting where they range to following elk and deer up the mountain and clear off the winter range. I mean, you know, they're covering 70, 80 miles. Yeah. Wow. To follow the game. So are they, so are they, uh, are they like bucks, you know, in the rut, they going to travel further, obviously. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's when you get a lot of your really big toms. Yeah. Predominantly. It's the first part of season before the snow really hits. You can usually find a good cat track. And then during the breeding time here in, in March and end of March in into April is when them big toms just start ranging. Yeah. And I mean, once the breeding season comes around, you're checking that road that that track went through every two weeks. Uh, not checking it because he was on a one-way mission <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's that time of the year <laughs> he's talking about uh you're at the average kill statewide and you've been doing this for quite some time now what's your what do you think a rough estimate on the amount number of cats that you've killed in your career along with your uh out outfitting you know guiding people too uh killed me personally i've only ever harvested one mountain lion in 20 years of hunting i probably caught Damn. oh close to six seven hundred lions in my 20 years 
you know, I mean, there was winters we'd catch, you know, 30 plus lions a winter. And of those, you know, I'm only harvesting probably, it depends on the hunters. I mean, I've, I've treed 12 and this is a really slow winter. It's been in the sixties and like, yeah. it's not been great. So I've caught 12 and we've harvested four. Oh, okay. Um, if I don't have a pay hunter, all I usually just let them go. If I'm not having a pay hunter, or a really good friend or family member that wants a lion, usually I let them go. And I mean, my wife, bless her heart, she still has yet to shoot a lion because I'm like, ah, not big enough. Not big enough. <laughs> <laughs> so Part do of you... that, hopefully she never listens to this. Part of that's because of the taxidermy bill that comes along with them. Oh, yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> I, how, how much is that usually? Well, a life-size mountain lion right now with uh, the – increase in shipping and foam is running about seventy five hundred dollars holy cow lord yeah what about so a rug? Like, well a rug they're about a hundred that's where they get you it's about a hundred and eighty to two hundred bucks a linear foot and nose to tip a tail is almost nine feet on these lions so oh, they're wow they're dinging you down for about a 10 foot square bear yeah yeah. For the same price. So, I mean, you're into them 22 to 25, depending on your felt. And I mean, it's, it's pricey and you know, a guy comes out and that's what a lot of hunters don't realize. I mean, even going to Russia or Africa, getting your trophies back and getting them mounted is just half the hunt cost. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's you also, know, there's a lot involved in it. Go ahead. There's a lot involved in it for sure. Yeah, and it's it's a cost. People, for instance, last winter I had two hunters in camp at the same time, and we we hunted till the very last day, and we were able finally got some snow, and we're finally able to freshen these lion tracks up, and we harvested two lions in one day, two mature lions, and those guys went to the taxidermist. By the time it was said and done, there was they were about $16,000 with shipping into their adventure. And then they had, you know, $12,000 in the hunt. I mean, you know, that's almost 40,000 bucks. Yeah. Good Lord. Or 30,000. Sorry. My math was a little off, but that's, that's hefty. I think I'd rather do yeah. it than go to the Super Bowl, though. I mean, you're looking at a Super Bowl ticket for $35,000. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you want to go watch the same game you can watch or look at your mount, mountain lion on the wall and think of the hunt you had? Yeah, that, yeah. I'd rather I'd rather take the yeah, memory. The experience that came with it. Second yeah. to none. Oh, a- it's... It's like something, I'll tell you what, when you got to crawl in a cave with a pistol and shoot it <laughs> or harvest that lion, yeah. that's when you really get wild. Oh, I uh, can't do it. Uh, I can imagine that. So that's another question I was going to have. Do you have people, like you said, you, you normally don't kill them if you're not going with a paid uh, outfitter or hunter or something like that that wants to keep the animal do you have people that want to come hunt them just for the experience? Yeah, I have um, some photographers that come just to take pictures of mountain lions in the trees and oh, okay. various forms. I'll actually uh, can send you some pictures that they took that are really phenomenal work. Wow, nice. And so, yeah, there's there's people that you know, genuinely just want to go and see what it's about. And, um, now do you, you charge know, them you, for that? Or is that something that you just do complimentary? I do that complimentary because anything in Wyoming, if you take money to take someone out, you have to be licensed or outfitted. Oh, okay. And gotcha. it has to go through an outfitter. You can't take your Technically, it's illegal to even take your buddy up 
hunting and make him pay for the gas to go to your secret spot, that can be <laughs> polluted <laughs> as illegal outfitting okay. is what they call. Well, I mean, I can so, see that. Yeah. But I mean, you don't, you don't get a ton of, uh, of, uh, interest in it. Cause a lot of those guys, I mean, they want to go when conditions are good, when the snow is perfect in the trees. I mean, and yeah. it, it always seems like a fun time until you're on the back of like a tail end of a Tom and you're on the long side of it and you're out for 14 to 16 hours on foot. <laughs> That that really sucks all the energy of it yeah. being fun out. Oh, I guarantee it. Yeah, yeah. I can imagine. So, and, uh, you know, talking about do, doing a lot of this is as fun stuff, kind of like just what's the um, the danger in it? Just doing it for the sport of it to get a, somebody a picture. I mean, how often do these lions attack dogs and fight the dogs? Well, not as often as you would think the i've been doing it 20 years and i've never lost a dog to a cat i've had them so get no like up. Fire, then. nope they won't unless they're wounded they won't back up to a tree and start spinning and single a dog out and get it killed okay okay but if you put them in a hole or a culvert where them dogs can't know they're where the mother dogs are bumping them into them and them dogs can't fight or move in a hole. And they just got their face where that cat can sit back on its paws and fight with its front legs. Yeah. And I mean, they'll, they'll wreck some dogs, but I mean, usually they hit them a couple times and they don't suck them in that the most dangerous time that I've ever, that I come across is when a lion's, like really fresh off of a kill. Uh, they call it when they have their green eyes because their pupils are so dilated. Like all as you can see is the hint of that green reflection off their eyes because it's just all pupils up in the tree and it shines green, you know, if you were to spotlight it. Wow. It, it, they're, and it's because they're hopped up on so much adrenaline for, I mean... You know, these animals are killing mature bull elk, dragging them to the ground yeah. and working down their body to get to their neck to either get their fangs through their jugular or close their windpipe off and kill them. I mean, it's right. a, yeah. I mean, I would think it would be very similar to being in combat in a firefight situation. So if you, for those guys who have served and been in that situation, the adrenaline dump on that, if you're still on that high, it's very dangerous yeah. for dogs coming in because they're so amped up and then they're going to try to protect the kill where here in Wyoming, we have a wolf population. And those mountain lions are leaving those kills when animals come on to it mm -hmm. you know instead of you know years ago if you would find a kill and it wasn't uncommon to find a coyote or two dead around there that came in and the lion was laid up on it and lion stood up and the coyote didn't run away and it got killed oh wow yeah i could see that yep and so that's that's probably the the only dangerous thing about it is those couple of situations. Other than that, I mean, them cats go up a tree real easy. I shouldn't say everyone, but they go up a tree, and a lot of times, if they've been caught a few times, they're asleep in the tree by the time you get there. You'll just hear them <laughs> purring like your house cat, and you'll just see their tail just lightly jagging, and usually so you that's when walk. you climb the tree and pet them. Yeah, I'll, well, <laughs> I've got some pictures of pulling on a lion's tail alive. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Ooh, man, I can only yeah, imagine. I did it for a picture because the guy really wanted a picture of this lion hissing. Ooh. And this lion wouldn't hiss at us no matter what I did. And so I had to climb up there and I grabbed its tail just by the tip of its tail and 
pulled on it a few times and he finally started hissing. <laughs> wow. So how far so, up are they uh, usually? How what? How far up are they usually in the in the trees? Uh de- depends on the trees and the place you're at. So they'll so in the northeast corner we got a lot of ponderosas, so they go up quite a ways before they branch. Okay. So and when you get into the pine trees and stuff, they usually like over around Buffalo and Jackson area, they don't go that high because the tree really tapers down and yeah. in the wind, they don't like to be up there in that movement. So they may only tree five, 10 feet off the ground mm. versus some trees, they're 60 feet up. Okay. You know, a lot of it has to do with uh, the wind and the conditions and kind of what terrain you're in. I mean, my dogs, some of them will just, if they can make it up that tree, they'll follow that dang cat all the way to the top. (laughs) And then never even think how they're going to get out of it. But I can tell you this, I've never had a hound dog in all the hundred of hound dogs I've owned ever be able to get out of a tree gracefully. They can get up it good, but yeah. coming out is nothing you want to see. Oh, I I can guarantee you that's pretty pretty painful for them. Uh, usually you got to go up and get them. <laughs> you get to a point and then they just start crying for you to come up there and get them and you're like, "Oh boy, this yeah. ain't going to end good for either of us." <laughs> But you do it for the love of the dogs. I mean, there's, I was in a hole with a lion, oh, probably four years ago. And I was grabbing dogs and pulling them over me to catch them with my legs because I was laying on my back and I was pulling dogs out of this cave and holding them in my legs. And then my buddy was pulling them back out of the hole that way. And crap i got the last dog and i mean they're stepping on your face and your chest and you know trying to get back in there so they're clawing you in the chest and stuff them dogs and i got the last one out and i'm like laying there i'm like well you know thankfully i got these things out of there because you know them 60 pound dogs they're all muscle Mm -hmm. and oh yeah yeah they're tough to wrestle around in there when they want to go into something you gotta and about the time I got the last one out, I look up because I, I heard it growl at me. And I'm like, you know, because it was finally quiet in there because the dog's barking was it was just echoing and chaos. And I look up and that thing's about a foot and a half from my face <laughs> looking oh. down at me. So that, that one was a little unnerving. I'm and bad. you're trying to shimmy out of there and he's looking... He's looking, yeah, it was, it was probably one of the most unnerving I've ever came across in all my years. Mm-hmm. I can imagine. So we've talked mostly about lions. You guys do a lot with uh, bobcats as well, correct? Yes. Yes, sir. That's, uh, that is my, by far my favorite thing to hunt with hounds. It's uh, not your traditional long lined lion races. I mean, there are lions that'll juke and that have been educated that are really smart, really hard running cats, but then bobcats run like a lion and fight like a bear. I mean, they, in one, they'll stay in one Canyon in one square mile and your dogs will do 25 miles trying to trail on the jump. Trying uh-huh. to catch them bobcats, and I mean they backtrack, they run circles around them dogs. Yeah, and your average bobcat's <laughs> probably what thirty, forty pounds. Yeah, you know we get a lot of so we here in the Rockies and where we're at, we're part of Montana, Wyoming, and a little bit of Colorado that have the blue bobcat. It's got um, bluing in it instead of that brown. So they're real gray looking. They look like a lynx almost. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that is only found 
in this part of, you know, in the Rockies here. Yeah. They're, they, they don't exist anywhere else. So they're, they're pretty cool animals. I mean, I've ran bobcats in Texas and Arizona and stuff and they're, you know, bobcats, bobcat, but they're got a lot of brown in them where yeah. ours are. Are you there? We may, have lost. We, lose him. we may have lost him. Yep. We lost him. Hold on just a second. Did we lose you? I'm not sure what happened here in Wyoming. It's tough to say. We got a storm coming in tonight. And, well, I think it's supposed to hit tomorrow and Thursday. So you oh, never okay. know with cell service out here. Yeah. Right. Well, that's where podcasts come in handy because you can't always pick up a radio station, but you download a couple podcasts. Yeah. And you can listen to those while you're going around looking for tracks because unfortunately some the bad part about it is to do it a lot and be highly successful you got to spend a lot of time and a lot of miles out there in the woods i oh, mean yeah. you know i put about two to three thousand miles a winter on a ranger goodness to let you know how much time in the saddle i spend yeah and i and when you go to like so Sholo, Arizona was 15 hours in my truck one way to get there to hunt. Mm. <laughs> so I was dropping a couple dogs off and I picked a couple dogs up and uh, just leaving some dogs down there for my buddy to hunt. And then I'll take some of his pups next winter. Yeah. Speaking of dogs, what kind of dogs are you running mainly? So that's where Isel. Well, fo- hound guys will fault me because there's a lot of guys that are true to one bloodline and this is sure. this is what I've ran and this is what works here and I have a mixed bag of everything. I've hunted in enough states and made enough hound friends. I run I pick my dogs and the style of dogs I like off of how they're built and who they're from. But I have blue ticks, walker, walker blue ticks, plot, blue ticks, plots, curs. I got a little bag of everything. Yeah, I was definitely going to say blue ticks. You know, the yeah. blue ticks are, I like them. Um, but mine come out of a Hendrix bloodline out of Utah. That's a small built. I mean, they're 45 pound blue ticks. Man. Wow. And then we've them mountain crossed, curs, though they got the fight in them. Well, the curs are they're fast. I mean, it all depends on where you live and what you do is the dogs that are best suited for you. You know, and sure. West Virginia and stuff where you guys are from, you got a lot of deadfall, a lot of thick stuff, and a lot of bears. And you guys got uh, you guys have been hound hunting bears for years and years, so most of those bears are either fighters or runners. Mm-hmm. And so yep. you, you guys breed big dogs, leggy dogs with a ton of grit here. We're dealing with a lot of rocks, a lot of ledges, you know, steep country and a lot of deadfalls. So I look for more like 45, 50 pound dogs that are short and small and can get through that country quick that they don't get hung up in it. Yeah. Yeah. But no, it's just kind of, I run what works. And I mean, I only raise a couple of dogs. I'm, I don't do like a lot of hound guys and raise a litter at a time. Cause it's counterproductive. If you get a bunch of pups together, they're, it ain't no different than a bunch of teenagers together. They're, <laughs> yeah, they're eventually going to be up to no good. Yep, yep. And if you got two, one pup that's got great potential, but he won't leave the side of another pup, you know, he probably not going to ever be his full potential. So I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty selective on how what dogs I run, and it, a lot of it has to do with what my friends have that I've ran lions with for years. And if I think what they made is a good cross and I want to try it. Yep. Well, let's hit on something real quick and then we'll let you go. Um, 
I know we we planned on only doing about 30, 45 minutes. We're already 51 minutes in, so (laughs) we get to talking like this, and, you know, we can get going forever. But just to hit on something real quick, we talked about it before the podcast. There's some controversy going on in Washington and California, so they're also trying to do this in Colorado and follow suit. Tell us a little bit about that real quick, and we'll jump off here. Well, so they got a ballot initiative, um, which they're collecting signatures for to basically the antis have figured out in all states to circumvent your game and fish, your DNR and the guy biologists and go straight to the lawmakers and make them make game and fish do what they want. Mm. And so they're collecting signatures to put a ban on the use of uh, dogs to pursue, harvest, or anything where, for mountain lions or bobcats. And they've already taken trappers' rights away to leg hold or snare trap on any public land in the state of Colorado. You can only live trap oh, wow. on public wow. lands. And so that's really affected the coyote population and the bobcat and your predator population. And Colorado's got one of the highest densities of mountain lions. I mean, they're harvesting 400, almost 500 lions a season. They're doubling what we do. Wow. After they just introduced wolves with no contingencies and no seasons protection for them. Oh goodness gracious! And so once they, once that population explodes, those lions will do just like they did in Yellowstone. I mean, we're seeing them in South Dakota. Nebraska's actually got a really healthy population of lions that not many people know about or even talk about. Yeah, and they have no use of dogs and in Oregon you can pursue bobcats with dogs but you can't pursue lions and in those areas I got some family over there and uh outside of Salem Oregon it's a 75 cat quota unit with no use of dogs and they harvest maybe three lions a year Mm. wow and they have issues with lions I mean there was a a girl in Washington that shot a lion that was stalking her brother on the way to the bus stop. Good Lord. But no, they're trying to get that collect enough signatures for the ballot that will go into effect this voting season in November in the state of Colorado. And it's, it, I mean, that'll set a president's, with a lot of these Western states, if guys don't band together and it, you don't have to be for hunting for hound hunting, but just to be for hunting. I mean, yeah. if you think they're going to stop with the hounds, no, it'll just keep I going. Mean, yeah. They'll keep yeah. taking more and more and more. And yeah, you know, they don't, they don't have to take the guns. They can take the bullets. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Sure. Can. But no, it's it's a bad deal, and I I hope Colorado votes on the right side of it. But yeah. uh, we'll, well see. we do as well, Tyler. It's yeah, been great. Go ahead, buddy. Sorry. That's a that's a huge thing, and and a lot of sportsmen's. I try to get it across to every sportsman I can. If if you're for hunting and you're for enjoying the outdoors, you need to be against bills like this. It doesn't matter if if you don't like mountain lion hunting with dogs, your neighbor might. Yeah. I mean, and if you vote against him, the next ballot that says, hey, from now on you gotta use slingshots on turkeys <laughs> and he's gonna return the favor and vote it that way because yeah. right? he's going to be like well you didn't help me out when i needed it right and i don't turkey hunt so i don't care yeah wow so That's it's nuts. it's a good thing and yeah like i said we'll probably put a name to some faces here uh like you guys are scheduled to come out to wyoming uh 
next spring. Yes. Yeah, we're going to uh, we're going to actually host a hunt, so we're going to talk about that in our next couple episodes. Um, we're going to be hosting a hunt there at Highland Outfitters, so if you guys would like to come out and hunt with us and do a live podcast out there and just get the real experience of deer camp or hunt camp, whatever you want to call it. So, Tyler, it was great yeah, having be, you on I'll this evening. Be out. Yeah, I'll be out there to help. Yeah, that'll be great to finally meet you, man. It's like I said, so it's been. We a, may just take you up on a little walk about and check out this, uh, this flying hunt and stuff just to see one. Because yeah. I've never well, seen one live in, in the wild. Yeah. I well, either. that one lion picture I sent you, the spider one, that lion actually came from right where you guys are going to be staying. It's on that rancher's wall. That was a deprivation hunt that. That lion walked right by those cabins and killed a cow down there. Oh, my goodness. Wow. That, that's a massive cat, too. Yeah, it's – and of those cats, everybody – there's a real misconception about people thinking, oh, yeah, you know, I'm on a 180-pound cat. Neither one of those cats weigh oh, – the one bright one is probably a 140-pounder, and then the one over Christmas, it was probably close to 160. Man. Wow. That's nuts. And I mean, they look impressive. And I mean, it's it's kind of like bears, you know, guys. Yeah. You know, back east there where they don't hibernate, they get better body weight. But, you know, you go to any of the western states, I mean, trying to kill a 500-pound bear is oh, yeah. something. It is. Something different. Well, like we said, man, we sure appreciate you coming on this evening. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it has. Thank, good talking to you guys. Yep, it was yeah, good talking to you. It. That was very, very intuitive. A lot of knowledge come out of this one tonight. Yep, very interesting. Perfect. Yeah, when you guys come to deer or to turkey camp, you better bring some of that rub, and I'll I'll, I'll bring you guys some elk or whatever you guys cook <laughs> it. You yeah, we'll we'll, we'll definitely absolutely we'll definitely be bringing some hunt chef with us for sure. Perfect. That will work. All right, man. Well, it was good talking to you, and you have a good evening. We sure appreciate it. All right. You guys as well. All right, man. Have a good one. All right, guys. Be sure you check Highland Outfitters out at highlandoutfitters.com, and you can also check on their pricing there as well. You know, they're insured and bonded, licensed through the Wyoming, um, and Board of Outfitters, BG082. So just give them a... Give them a look there on on, uh, Facebook or on their webpage. So thanks for listening, guys. We sure appreciate it. Be sure to check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and about 18 other different networks. Wherever you get your podcast, you'll see us there. So give us a like and a share and a subscribe. Have a good night, everyone. This episode of On the Limb with Nature's Voice Game Calls is brought to you by Will Jewelry and Loan. When you need cash and you need it fast, check out Will Jewelry and Loan. Come on in with your jewelry, firearms, electronics, tools, lawn equipment, dirt bikes, side-by-sides, and even four-wheelers. They will be any competitor's loan amount, and that's a fact. Will Jewelry and Loan guarantees faster and more cash for your loan than any other company in the area. They have your cash you need fast. Check them out today on their Facebook page or give them a call at 304-768-5101. Stop in and talk with them at 5523 McCorkle Avenue, Southwest, South Charleston, West Virginia. Will Jewelry and Loan, 304-768-5101.